So today we'll be going over some initial value problems as well as some unique solutions, as well as some practical applications of differential equations in mathematical models of real life scenarios. So we'll first start off with initial value problems. And for this first problem, we have a differential equation. Y prime plus 2xy squared is equal to 0. Now, one of the one parameter family of solution given here is y is equal to 1 divided by x squared plus an arbitrary constant. Now, it, this is considered a one parameter family of solutions because it has only one arbitrary constant. And we do have an initial condition of um, when you plug in 2 for in this equation, you your solution is 1 third. So all you do is to find this arbitrary constant is plug in 2 for x and just solve for c. So let's go ahead and do that. y2. So you have y2 is equal to 1 divided by you plug in that 2 for the x squared plus c is equal to 1 third. And go ahead and just do some algebraic manipulations and solve for c c is equal to negative 1. So your solution is y is equal to 1 divided by x squared take away 1. And so the next part of this problem is to actually give the largest interval over which this solution is defined. And so one thing to notice, of course, x cannot be equal to plus or minus 1 because in this case you'll have a denominator with 0. And so so this solution will be defined from negative infinity to negative 1, and then from negative 1 to 1, and then from 1 to infinity. But since this particular problem came with an initial condition when x is equal to 2, your y is equal to 1 third. So in this case, x is within this region. So this would be your largest interval in which that solution would be valid from 1 to infinity. So now for the second problem, we actually have the differential equation x double prime plus x is equal to 0, with the two parameter family of solutions being x is equal to c1 cosine t plus c2 sine t. Now, the reason it's known as a two parameter family solution is because it has two arbitrary constants as a solution. And we are given a initial condition. So when you plug in pi over 6 in the function x, so pi over 6 will be plugged in for the t values here, your answer would be a 1 half. So using this initial condition, you could just plug in and solve for your arbitrary constants 1 and 2. One thing I forgot to mention, since this does have two arbitrary constants, it will need um, basically two initial conditions, right? For your x um, at pi over 6 is equal to 1 half, and then the x derivative would be pi over 6 is equal to 0. So you will be required to have two solutions for the x and the, its derivative to be able to solve for the two arbitrary constants here. So we'll first start off with solving for x at pi over 6. So we have c1 cosine pi over 6 plus c2 sine pi over 6. And you just simplify, right? The c1 is equal to rad 3 over 2 plus c2 1 half. And this is equal to 1 half as shown here. So this will be your first equation. And for your second equation, you get the derivative of x. And the derivative of x is equal to negative c1 sine t plus c2 cosine t. And now you just plug in the pi over 6 for t. And then you have your second equation. So negative c1 times 1 half plus c2 times rad 3 over 2 is equal to 0. This would be your second equation. So you have two equations and two unknowns, so you're able to solve for each arbitrary constant. So let's start out with equation 1 and manipulate a bit to get c1 by itself. So let's go ahead and move c1 on the other side of the equation. And from here, you just multiply both sides of the equation with 2 to cancel it out and get c1 um, by itself. So we see that c1 is equal to c2 times rad 3. And now from here, we just plug it in to equation 1 and get one of the solutions. So plug it into equation 1, you have c2 rad 3 times rad 3 over 2 plus c2 over 2 is equal to 1 half. And now right here you have one equation with only one unknown being c2 and you solve for c2 here. 
So now after um, factoring out the C2 and solving, you have C2 is equal to 1 fourth. And then you go ahead and solve for C1. And you see that C1 is equal to rad 3 over 4. So now you have found the two arbitrary constants, which aren't so arbitrary anymore. You have C1 is equal to rad 3 over 4, and C2 is equal to 1 fourth. So now let's go ahead and plug it into the two parameter family of solutions that we initially had with the arbitrary constants. So after plugging in the arbitrary constants, this is our solution to the differential equation. So now let's go over unique solutions. And for this, I would like to use the previous example we just did. So we have C1 cosine t plus C2 sine t is the two parameter family of solutions for the differential equation x double prime plus x is equal to zero. Now this, of course, is not a unique solution because you have arbitrary constants C1, C2. It could be any constants whatsoever in for C1 and C2. Now, when it becomes a unique solution, that was the um, that was the solution we actually had for the previous problem, which was. Now the solution was x is equal to rad 3 over 4 cosine t plus 1 half sine t specifically for the initial conditions that were given, right? It was for the specific points at t equals pi over 6 and your x is equal to 1 half. So this was a unique solution for your differential equation at these two points here. If you can imagine, it could be your x and y points, for instance. So we'll go ahead and do a example problem for this one. So for the first example, we have x dy dx is equal to y. So let's get to a form that we're a little bit more familiar with. So we have dy dx is equal to y over x. Now, what is the domain of this differential equation? Well, it could be x could be anywhere between negative infinity to zero as well as zero to infinity. In other words, it's this differential equation is not valid um, for zero. Now let's go ahead and get the derivative of this function with respect to y. So <clears throat> the derivative of the function with respect to y which is 1 over x. Now, it's the exact same um, domain for the derivative of that function, right? Um, it's valid anywhere as long as x is not equal to 0. So to determine if this has a unique solution, all you have to do is get the original function, which was dy d dx is equal to y over x. The domain is anywhere from negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. And you get also get the derivative of that function with respect to y and also get the domain. Now, as long as it's within the domain, there exists a solution, a unique solution for this differential equation. As long as any point, let's call it x naught, y naught, as long as these points are within the domain of negative infinity and zero and zero to infinity, there exists a unique solution for this differential equation. So yes, there, there exists a unique solution, which was the question that was being asked. So for this example, it asks, determine a region for which the, this given differential equation would have a unique solution that passes through point x naught and y naught in that region. So let's so we have four take away y squared times y prime is equal to x squared. So our differential equation y prime is equal to x squared over four take away y squared. Now this is our our function, right? Our function with respect to x and y this differential equation. So now, as long as our function x and y, as well as our the derivative of that function with respect to y, as long as these two are continuous within a certain region, therefore a unique solution exists. So we are here to determine what region that is. So lo let's go ahead and get the derivative of that function with respect to y, utilizing, of course, the chain rule. So for the function given, you have x squared divided by 4 take away y squared. And the derivative of that function with respect to y, you have 2x squared y divided by 4 take away y squared squared. So as you can tell for both of the solutions, y cannot be, it will be undefined 
So y cannot be either plus or minus 2. So therefore, um, for both of the functions, the function and the derivative of that function, um, the domain is anywhere except for plus or minus 2. Therefore, a unique solution exists anywhere between negative infinity to negative 2, then negative 2, 2, 2, and 2 to infinity. A unique solution does indeed exist within these regions. So now we'll be going over mathematical models. So what exactly is a mathematical model? Well, it's nothing more than an equation that describes a certain system, a mechanical system. It could be a free falling body. It could be with respect to the displacement, the velocity, the acceleration, and so forth. It's actually able to describe um, physical reality, which is what's so amazing about it and the most practical application for differential equations. So let's go ahead and do an example of a free falling body. So for this free falling body, so we'll be representing this free falling body as an instantaneous dot. It could be representing either just a, a ball falling in free space, it could be a parachuter, and so forth. Usually you always make simplifications in these mathematical models. The more um, realistic they are, the more complicated these equations. So for this case, it'll be a very simple um, instantaneous dot. Um, free falling, of course, so we have gravity, so gravity, gravity is putting it at it downwards, so the weight of it, mass times gravity, and of course, we'll be including air resistance. Now, for this particular um, example, we'll be doing a parachute, parachuter falling with air resistance that's approximately to the power of the instantaneous velocity, so let me go ahead and draw that. So, of course, a free-falling body, you have weight pulling it down, but, of course, you have air resistance resisting that movement, which is a k constant times the velocity squared in this case. So, now, the question is, determine a differential equation for the velocity of this falling body with mass m and with the air resistance equal to k velocity squared. So this is nothing more than a force balance. So the summation of forces along the y direction, because that's the only direction we see forces along. So we have, let's say, the values going up is positive, values going down is negative. So we have positive kv squared take away mg. And this will be equal to the mass of the body that we're analyzing and its respective acceleration. So we have k times v squared take away mg is equal to m. And another way of writing acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, or dv dt. So this would be your differential equation. So going back to your physics course, this is actually how they derive those kinematic equations, assuming constant acceleration and as well as um, neglecting air resistance, which is pretty cool. So for this example, we'll be using a spring with a mass hanging at the end of that spring. So initially, this spring is at this, um, this length originally, and then you hang a box with a mass m and it displaces, let's say, a s amount. So it displaces at equilibrium position. So you initially have that spring, then you load it with some load, it, it gets displaced a certain amount s, and then at this point it's at equilibrium position. Now afterwards, you actually start moving that, that mass downward, and then you leave that system moving up and down. So now we're being asked to derive a, come up with a differential equation that describes the displacement of this um, mass m with respect to time, of course. So keep in mind, initially, the spring displaces s, s amount, but after in motion, it gets displaced x amount from here. And let's assume downward direction is positive for this case. So this would be nothing more than a, a force balance, right? So let's go with equilibrium position. At this position, let's simplify a bit. We'll draw that box with mass m as a dot. You have your 
mass times gravity straight down and then you have your your spring which is the your spring constant times the s that was originally displaced and now from here once it's actually displaced let's go ahead and draw that dot again it'll be same way mg times your spring constant but in this case it's already been originally displaced s amount plus an additional x amount so it'll be your mg and uh, your upper force will be k s plus x so in this case we just do again a um a so in this case we add up the forces in the system with respect to the y direction right it's only 1d so we have your original m g going downward which is positive minus k times s plus x but remember keep in mind let's go going back to your equilibrium you add the forces here the summation of forces in your equilibrium position so downward is positive m g take away k s now in this case since it's at equilibrium there's absolutely no movement therefore your acceleration of this system will is zero so mg take away ks is equal to zero therefore k um, s is equal to mg and from here you're able to use this relationship and make some simplifications over here when you distribute that k you have the s and you're able to simplify it so once you distribute, you see that the, your weight cancels off and then you're left with negative kx. And this is equal to the mass of the system times your rate of change, your second derivative rate of change of displacement with respect to time. Remember, it's the mass times your acceleration of the system in this case we're using with respect to displacement so it'll be the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time so this is your differential equation so this is your differential equation m times the second derivative x with respect to t plus kx is equal to zero